Don't put this on the vlog. <laughs> Sure. Because she immediately went to the bed, mm -hmm. to her bed, and then did like a four in a day, like a Yep, yep. So, uh, so the question is, if, you know, when is it too late to, to correct her? Welcome. Hey, Good. Well, well, so if, if we didn't catch it, right, you, there's not anything you could do about it, right? Which is why we talk about, right, supervision is very important, especially, right? You, you got to keep in mind, right, she's still a puppy. Right? So like she has training, she listens, she'll do different things, stuff like that. But like, you know, she's still learning over the course of her life, right? Like what she can get away with and what she can't get away with, right? Which is where 90% of your issues still are is from the standpoint of, I think you're looking too much at her like she's this like grown dog that can roam the house and do all these things and stuff like that. As opposed to she's still a young dog that needs direction. You know what I mean? Um, and the only way you can get past those things is by making sure that we're in a position to give direction all the time, right? Mm -hmm. And you know, you, like you said, you know, you try, you've tried to be better about putting stuff near the center of the table and stuff like that. But like, what, the second she knows she can get up there and go get stuff, it doesn't matter where you put it, right? She's gonna go and do it. <laughs> and and this is where, right? Like, so stuff like that can become very dangerous, not just yeah. for the human, but for the dog. You know what I mean? Because because like you were saying, right, like we see dogs all the time that, you know, people just can't get a handle on, you know, supervising well enough and then you wind up, right, she consumes something that's either toxic, right, and she has to have her stomach pumped or obviously some of those things can be fatal or obviously you get blockages that then result in $4,000 surgeries to get, you know what I mean? Like, like it's really, really, really important. You've got to set yourself a period of time where you could say she's not going to be out of our sight, right? Whatever that means, whether that's um, just, you know, you have you know, if you're hanging out in the formal living room like you were talking about, if you could, you know, either keep her on a bed when she's in there, you could gate the area, you could make sure she's on a leash where you could take that leash and back tie it to something, right? Like whatever you need to do, if you're, if you're gonna go take a shower for 20 minutes, you know, it, just stick her in the crate, bring her in the bathroom with you and close the door. You know what I mean? That you gotta figure out some sort of routine where you could block this habit where she's getting away with, even if it's five minutes, right? Rehearsing something and you not catching it. And every time that happens, it strengthens it in her head of, I can get away with this, mm -hmm. right? And it doesn't matter how well the dog is trained. If they start realizing they can get away with those types of things, they're gonna do it. I'll give you an example, right? Um, when I go out of town, I usually leave one of my dogs with my parents, right? And she's like 10, tell her, perfect. No, that was good, yeah. So, um, and that's what I mean, right? Like, so we caught it. We corrected for it, right? So now we need to make sure for the next seven days, right? Every time she does that, that happens, right? Because if she realizes it is inevitable, right? Every time I rehearse this behavior, this is the consequence for it. We see inhibitions be created so fast. But the problem is, let's say 10 minutes from now, she does that again and doesn't get a correction for it. She's like, oh, maybe that was a fluke last time. Let me keep trying. And that's how that stuff works, right? But anyway, so my one dog, she's 10. She's, I would consider my best behaved dog that I have. I trust her to the moon and back in my house. She's really good, listens really well, really calm, stuff like that. <laughs> this was maybe a year and a half ago, two years ago, something like that. I'm out of town and my parents call me and they're like, yeah, Vera got on the counter and ate an entire nut roll. They just made right? like a whole, whole thing of nut roll. They're like, and I'm like, what? Like she, she never does that, right? Like why would she have done that? And it's because right that she's not supervised half of the time she's there. She's wandering the house, getting away with doing whatever she wants to do. You know what I mean? So she immediately realizes, well, I know I can't do that with dad, right? Or when I'm at home, when I go to grandma and grandpa's house, right? Obviously the the rules are a little bit different, yeah. right? And that just goes to show, like I said, it, a lot of this is just that, that lifestyle of like, you know, we have to put in place these protocols of, of, of understanding, one, she's really young and needs that direction right now. Two, the consequences for these behaviors just have to maintain consistent. You know what I mean? <clears throat> so, so that's half of it. And you know, obviously, like you said, you've made strides, right? She's better with the walking. I think when we talked over the phone, you said the walking is going better. She's listening excuse me, a little better with certain things, obviously, but those things are only gonna get you so far, right? Those are like your management tools to make sure that you can keep an eye on her. When guests are coming over, you can get her out of the way. When you're walking with her, it's enjoyable, all those types of things. But what we really want is we wanna hit that point where she can just be a dog in the house and just 
hang out, roam around, right? We can enjoy her. She's not getting into things, all those types of things. And that comes from the important side of things, which is just us consistently providing the consequences in the house for the improper behaviors. So she just learns the ropes, right? Mm -hmm. So from that standpoint, just because that's the first thing you talked about, I know it's the big thing, obviously, right? Yeah. Um, you've got to just be able to just say for a week, right? We are going to supervise her, right? We're not going to let her out of our sight, right? Mm -hmm. And anytime she does anything we don't want her to do, we have to consistently provide a consequence for it. And in most cases, when people are saying things like you're saying, which is how do I teach them something new? Really what they want to do is teach the dog to not do something. They want to teach a boundary, right? Mm -hmm. so, so that example, right? We'll have some clients that in their Diet, like with their, if they're sitting at the kitchen table eating, right? They have a perimeter of, you know, um, the area rug around the table. They don't want the dog coming on or something like that, right? Which is a clear one, right? That's, we, let's say this placemat was the area rug, right? And we're eating on the kitchen table. Every time she were to step on it, we would correct her and take her off, right? So she would start to learn, this is the boundary. I can't go with it, right? On the contrary, what you could do as well is if during mealtime she's getting annoying, right, and you want her to stop being annoying, let's look at, well, the command she already knows, can I just implement one of those to solve this problem, which a lot of clients also will implement just when we're eating, dog goes on a bed stay. Something she already knows, right, we could get her out of the way, it solves the problem of her begging for food, it solves the problem of her just being in the way on her foot and stuff like that. So, so we just look at what routine can we implement that will solve that problem and that's usually a really good solution for that as well. 99.9% like, of the issues that you would have with your dog can be solved with one of like the really three or four commands that she already knows. You know, there's not a whole lot extra that she really needs. She'll be sitting there, she's fine, we'll let her out of the command and go come, and she doesn't come. Yep. Oh, and then yeah, she, yeah, yeah. And then she doesn't I remember you saying the common command is a little bit. And then the, the problem is it's like, you know, like we don't have the, the collar sure. all the time. So then of course she doesn't come when they don't have the collar so Yep. <clears throat> Depends on the context, right? So one thing that I try to do with my dogs in the house is I use informal commands if I'm not in a position to enforce it, right? Meaning, let's say she's hanging out somewhere and I want to call her over to me to whatever, do whatever, right? Pat her, take her outside, something like that. I actually don't use formal come commands in that situation if I'm not in a position to back it up, right? I'll call, I'll say, come here, right? Hey, come on. Hey, come on, you know, I'll, I'll be excited. You know, something like that. That way, if she doesn't do it, I could just try again, frankly, or yeah. encourage her or something like that. Um, and she's not getting away with like blowing off like a formal known command. Yeah. And then I make sure when I give the commands, 100% of the time I'm in a position to back it up. So when she does have the collar on, if she's in the yard, right, or we're at the park or anything like that, I can give that come command and know with 100% certainty if she doesn't do it, I can correct for it, which maintains consistency of the command and gets her smoother with responding 100% of the time then. Yeah, well, she, she knows, like, oh, she knows now, Sometimes I just show it to her. Sure. And then she will just like, yep. she, she, she watches. She snaps too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. But, uh, but, yeah, but is it like a, she knows, I guess, you know, when she doesn't have it, she's like, oh, okay, well, you know. So I don't want to have that collar on all the time. Sure. You know, so, so here's how we get to a place where we don't need the collar, right? Now, first off, to be clear, right, it's still a long-term tool. You're still going to, I use it with my dog still, right? Like we've talked about this, right? Like I'm not contingent on it. Like if we're in a high distracting situation or if I'm guests come over or something like that, I'll put it on. But outside of that, they don't usually have it on in the house. Um, but how we get to a place where the dog listens really good without the collar is we get them listening 100% with the collar on first, right? So you're in this kind of gray area right now where you're still struggling with certain things with her. She's still not totally listened to you guys 100% of the time. So because of that, if we're flip-flopping between sometimes being able to enforce it, sometimes not being able to enforce it, that just creates more issues more confusion, right? So set yourself a goal, just like we talked about how you need to be able to say for a week, right, she's not gonna be out of our sight. We need to say for a week, we're always in a position to enforce something, which means she's gotta have that collar on all the time, right? And if you can do that for, you know, usually the collar one, once a dog goes home from their board and train, I usually say like a month usually. If you just have it on when you're out with her, like all the time. And just for, rotate it, what, every few hours from one side yeah, to the Yeah, correct. You know, at nighttime, obviously take it off. If you guys are leaving her alone or something like that, take it off, right? She doesn't need it on in those situations. But if you're hanging out with her, right, the collar should be on. And yeah, if it's on longer than like three or four hours, just spin it to the other side of the neck, right? Just move it around, bounce it from side to side. 
Sure, she's collar wise. Yeah. She knows right now there's a lot of times when it's on and a lot of times where it hasn't on. So that's why I said, right? So how we get them to a place where they listen when it's not on is we need to get them perfect with listening when it's on, but not just perfect with listening with it on like one or two times, perfect with listening with it on and that becoming like a habit. You know what I mean? As opposed to like, I'm only gonna listen because the collar's on. So it's, it's like, we want, we need this stuff to become habitual for her to just listen, right? And then past that, don't discount, like I don't know if you guys have any treats on you or anything right now, don't discount reinforcing the correct behavior, yeah, right? You if you okay get the treats perfect, so you right? Like you know, we wanna make sure obviously we're not, cause, cause a lot of the, her motivate, like she's a very motivated dog obviously, right? So like when we're working her for the food and stuff, like you saw engaged and motivated she was for it. And if we just totally throw that away like cold turkey. It's kind of like, same deal, the, the idea of like, how long are you gonna go to work for if you don't get a paycheck, right? Like not that long, right? <laughs> obviously, if you're forced to do so, like you're gonna continue doing it. And, and obviously that's where the e-collar comes into play. But we wanna kind of balance it out where it doesn't go from this was really fun to this just sucks all the time. You know what I mean? So we kind of leverage all of that. And regardless of how we're doing it, whether we're reinforcing with treats or we're correcting for not doing it with the e-collar, Behavior in general long term is consistent or contingent on consistent reinforcement, right? Meaning that there's gotta be some sort of incentive for her to do it, right? So so yeah, the, the one thing you could do right off the rip though is is yeah, again for the next week, she's gotta be supervised all the time, right? Like I said, however you need to do that for some clients, especially if you got a big house, a lot of places they could sneak off, it's difficult to gate it in because it's like an open concept and stuff. A lot of people will just have that leash on the dog, you know what I mean? And you know, just just if, if we're going in this room, hey Bea, sorry, you're coming with us. Looks really good. I mean, I think we, so, so I just wanna recap the couple of things that I want you to work on this week, right? So thing number one, she cannot be out of sight, right? Obviously we, we know that, right? I would use the leash, just keep the leash on her on the house, right? For right now, just for the next week, right? Um, that way you can make sure she's not out of your sight. Thing number two, she's also gotta have the e-collar on, right? You gotta be ready to correct this kind of stuff. Thing number three, set up some scenarios where you could try to catch her uh, getting on to getting into things she's not supposed to, right? Whatever you need to do. If you know there's something she really likes, take that thing, put it right on the counter. And like I said, you can even play the, you know, she thinks we're not supervising because we're around the corner, but like, you know, like we're, you're still watching her kind of thing. Um, that way you could be in a position to address it. The last thing would be with the feeding, I would cut her food back a little bit, right? I would personally, if it was my dog, I'd probably just do half cup, half cup. Uh, if you want to do like a heavy half cup or something, that might be fine also. Mm -hmm. So, but just see after a week of doing that if you notice any sort of uh, adjustment as far as her interest in the food. What's happening? Not much. How are you doing? Hello. Hi. Hi, dogs. What do you guys think? It's all just like, why am I here again? <laughs> yeah, she might be a little confused. I mean, we've never really walked them together since. <laughs> Okay, we can put our attention on that for sure today. So, all right, sweet. Well, let's go ahead and, I mean, we'll start right away with that. We'll maybe focus today on the walk and maybe some downstays or something like that with both of them together. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, we'll take them outside. We'll kind of get cruising. So walking two dogs together, not as hard as you think. Um, it's just a matter of looking at things a little different, right? So a lot of people look at it like two individual dogs. I always say, look at things like a unit when you're working them together with stuff. So I'm gonna give one command that is gonna be to both of them. No. I'm gonna give one command that's gonna be to both of them and then I'm just going to enforce it as such at that point. So I'm gonna have you guys hang out here for a second. I'm gonna go up and down the parking lot for a minute. I'm gonna give them both the come command, start walking. If either of them don't do it, I'll just mark with no and tap the corresponding button to whichever dog it is that we're working on. Come. No. Come. <clears throat> Mm-hmm. <clears throat> 
And then the secondary goal here is I shouldn't have to do anything with the leashes at this point. So you hold them loose enough, obviously, where they can make the mistakes, you could correct for it, and then they fix themselves. No, come. <clears throat> And a lot of this, you can tell she's just a little out of practice as far as the positioning we want her in. So we're just tightening that up and you see already it's looking a little bit smoother. That, that's kind of the idea behind giving corrections is like everybody kind of naturally like our human instinct is to be like you know as minimally invasive as possible as nice as possible with the corrections stuff like that but by doing that you're kind of just nagging them constantly right and again it, it works sometimes and it'll stop it in that moment sometimes but nothing about it hits a point where they're like all right i'm just not going to do that thing anymore you know what right. i mean yeah and if you look at the reality of again like we talked about behavioral issues let's take reacting in the house right or jumping on people or something like that we really need them to hit a point where they just realize jumping is not fun, right? Yeah. I don't like jumping, right? right. Yeah. <laughs> and that's what gets them to stop doing it long term. So. Looks awesome. Go ahead and just leave them there. I think they look really good. Yeah. I mean, that, this looks pretty good. So I'd like to see you um, work them together a little bit, put a little attention into your walk if you get some nice phase out, obviously. But past that, just working them together as a unit through all this stuff. So no more individual sessions, just work either some bed stays or some down stays or come commands or something like that. And you could progress to working like all of it like we just did off leash where you combine stuff. But maybe for this next week, isolate your commands one at a time, right? So work your bed stays, right? Then put those away, then work your down stays, then put those away, then work your common commands, right? Uh, make sure each piece looks good before you go to combine it all back together. He did fine while he was here. He picked up his training really, really well. He listens very well. Um, he's not like outwardly reactive towards anything that I've noticed. Um, the handling has gotten significantly better. He was just really weird initially about like putting collars on, touching his neck, like things like that. And again, it's not even that he ever did anything. He was just weird about it. And initially he would like kind of give us a side eye or give a little grumble or something like that. Um, and you just thought he was just like very apprehensive. Um, like I said, with the other dogs, it's not that he did bad by any means. He's just obviously like a quirky, intense dog. So he plays really intense um, and you know, again, the mounting stuff, which we corrected for, but um, the mounting stuff, he did a lot of that initially. So it was kind of one of those things where we were constantly watching it, like waiting for something to happen, but like nothing ever happened. Okay. 
You know what I mean? So it's just kind of like constant watching still, you know? Eating, he did pretty good with. In his kennel, initially he was a little funny with his food, uh, but out of the kennel, he didn't have any issues with it. And then the only other place we saw anything questionable was um, playing with him. So uh, he's super toy motivated. I don't know if you saw that or yeah. not. Very, very into togging and stuff, which is great, right? I have no problem with that. But initially, before we really started putting a lot of rules to the game, uh, I think at one point, uh, one of our trainers like let him win the tug and then went to go try to get it from him. He definitely tried to kind of guard it a little bit. Didn't try to bite or anything, but like kind of hover over it, a little bit of a growl, stuff like that. So right after that, we spent a lot of time really enforcing very strict outs, um, correcting if he didn't do it and stuff like that. And then we didn't see any problems after that with it, right? So it's just one of those things where, that's why I said it's kind of, I'll be interested to see how he does, and I'm glad that you're taking him, obviously, because you'll be able to see firsthand, obviously, and you're more competent than a lot of the people that would come in. Um, I'm interested to see how he does in the home with you, um, as far as all these types of things, if you notice any sort of weirdness and stuff like that. And the biggest thing, like I texted you about, is like with those quirky behaviors, like to an unsuspecting person, even though I haven't seen anything questionable out of him from the standpoint of him trying to do anything, I could definitely see how it could be off-putting to somebody. Out. Okay, come on. Out. So that's what I mean about that quick release. We had to focus a lot on that because what we saw at first is we would get him to release it. It would take him a couple seconds. He'd dilly dally let it go, but then he'd be so impulsive about trying to come back at it. And then past that, if you were walking around with it or something like that, he would be literally jumping on you, trying to bite at it and stuff. It was just causing some of those kind of like guarding like behaviors, so. Oh, good job. Bed. Very good. So we'll give him a second there, and then I'm gonna have you try to do some of that with him. And I wanna see how he plays with you, and then as well, um, how he releases it for you. So, and if you notice as you're playing with him, like initially he was kind of apprehensive to start tugging. More play, less control obviously. If you start noticing he's too eager for it, less play, more control, right? And you kind of wanna balance it out, where you're getting him where he's quick to re-engage back on the toy, um, but he's not too pushy over it, obviously. That's fine, yeah. So just tug with him for a little bit here, obviously. No worry about an out or anything yet. And then in a minute or so, once he's nice and engaged in it, give that out and stabilize the toy, obviously. So again, good way to burn off some steam with him, give him an outlet and practice control. Because again, where he gets himself into trouble is when he's in those heightened states of arousal. So by being able to simulate that and add that control to it, help him control that impulse a little bit better. So walking wise, he usually does great. I mean, he does a pretty good job of ignoring distractions and stuff. And as you can see, he walks pretty calmly with you and everything. So that's all been very positive.
Hi, Ernie. How's it going? Good. Hi, bud. Time to drop them off at two. Yep. This is good. Sure is. So what's up with Ernie? So, Ernie, um, we could use a little, a little help with um, just like the basic commands. Okay. Um, as well as I think. Um, A sock eating habit. A sock eating is, habit. Which is, nice. Um, you know, it, as he's gotten bigger, it's been okay in terms of like, so he's yeah. digested. It's not so much a health issue as it is like a problem. We don't want him eating socks or other things. So yeah. He'll jump quite a bit. I think he gets really excited. Sure. Excitable. And then um, in terms of like socializing with other dogs, um, he's been told he's not a good fit for like three doggy daycares just because he Did they say why? They said he gets too excitable when he's with a ton of other dogs. He starts barking. He's not able to read dog's cues that they don't want to engage with him, mm -hmm. I guess. Um, like they say, he continues to want to play with them even when they don't. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So. Um, have you done training with him before? He has, yeah. How much training have you done? Sure. So it was just like in-home lessons that you did? Yeah. Okay. And what sorts of things did you work on in it? So sitting, staying, um, healing, um, um, most of that, st uh, staying for a while. Uh, yep. And what was it that, so when you hired the first trainer, what was it that you hired them for specifically? Like, was there specific issues you were having at that point, or? Um, mostly walking. Walking. Mostly walking. Um, he, you know, was, you know, pull a lot. He, you know, is to the point where he could drag me down the street. Yeah, for that sure. Was, that was more of the, of the thing. And, that, and he would walk extensively at other dogs when we would try to walk. Sure. Um, and he, he was like a, he really didn't have any interaction with dogs for like the first like nine months of his life. Yeah. He right when he got his first sense, he, he broke a leg and was not able to be active for like yep. four months. So. Um, do you guys ever socialize him on your own with other dogs? We do. We do. Yeah. So he has some, some doggy friends. He really honestly, um, there's a great Dane that he's, he's seen a few times. He really doesn't engage. With, with like very much larger dogs or smaller dogs. Sure. Like, um, so, it, and then I've, I've seen him get like when there are tons, I think it's like when there's more than yeah. a couple dogs, he'll just kind of run around sure. and like get really, mm -hmm. he'll bark quite a bit and just yeah. kind of get right in the action. And your push to use daycare is. Um, yeah, go ahead. Do what you got to do. Um, your push to do the daycare, is that just because you work long hours, you're trying to socialize? Like, what's your goal in doing the daycare that you've tried to take them? The goal in doing the daycare, so we both do work pretty long hours. Sure. I have two days a week where I work a half day. <clears throat> yep. And so I come home, take him on a walk, but um, most days we are at work pretty long hours. Yeah. What's long hours? Um, so I like eight to six for me. Okay. And then my husband like anywhere from him being home for a week yeah. to like like 15, 16 hour day. So like yeah, 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 yeah. So ten hours, um, eleven hours sometimes, yeah. stuff like yeah. that. Okay. But in that case, I'm home. Like, no, I understand. Not alone for that long. Of a oh, time. okay, okay. Um, I understand. But. Uh, and does he get too ram? So you're home all the time. Does he get too rambunctious in the house? Is that some of it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so he, he gets very, um, like, excited to see any new person that's coming in. Sure. Like, and he'll jump up on them physically. Yeah. Um, 
does your work have a lot of guests coming into the house, like with with um, your work? Or no, no. So okay. it's mainly just like when company will come, like my parents I understand. or friends. Sure. Um, and he'll. His big thing too is like we had my grandmother over, and he rushes past yeah. you on the stairs, and we're just working oh, yeah. with the baby. Like. Well, it just the you know the reason why I ask all these yeah. questions is just yeah. as we create the solution, like once he goes yeah. home for all this, there's a couple of things that are very important as far as I always say, like expectations with things and how we're going to go about combating these issues. Yeah. And the daycare one specifically, you know, I talk about this all the time. We've made a ton of videos yeah. and stuff on this. There are just some daycares that are a bad fit for a lot of dogs. Okay. You know what I mean? And the fact that you've socialized them on your own, right? He's not like what they're saying, which is like this crazy butthead of a dog basically, right? Yeah, um, yeah you know, that typically leads me to believe, and we hear this all the time, right? Um, that most of these daycares, the, it's the environment that's causing the problems. And unfortunately, when we're going to new places like daycares or boarding kennels or things like that, once you leave and give that dog to them, it's one of those things where it's like you're at the mercy of what they do. You know what I mean? And we'll probably find with him that he's going to be perfectly fine with the other dogs because we know how to control the environment. Meaning, right, we're going to be able to obviously make sure that that unnatural, like, you know, 50 dogs in a room together that are all going crazy, that have very minimal training, supervised by one or two people kind of thing. We're going to be making sure that that, like, unrealistic environment just isn't happening because it's not conducive to socialization in a lot of cases. And then from an arousal standpoint, like this type of stuff, for example, where he's just kind of getting wild, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, obviously there's dogs and stuff like that. We're going to be able to communicate with him clearly through this kind of stuff to interrupt that state of mind. Okay. But the problem is training, unfortunately, is not this thing where it's like we're going to just put it on him. And then no matter where we take him or leave him or anything, he's just got this training on him and listens and doesn't do these things and stuff like that. It's a Training is a communication system where we learn how to effectively tell him what we want and what we don't want. You know what I mean? So, so I say this because, you know, even post this training, like you probably can take them back to all three of those places and they probably, if they're not changing anything they're doing, are going to tell you the exact okay. same thing. You know what I mean? That makes sense. Where, where are you located? We're in Little Italy. Okay, so you're more on the east side, obviously. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, you know, obviously if you are looking for like structured daycares and stuff, there's like one place that I recommend that's over that way that's in uh, Shaker Heights called uh, Process Canine that's really good, you know, from a daycare standpoint. The only thing is you might want to reach out to them sooner rather than later because they usually have like a multi-month long wait list. <laughs> so, but they're really good. Amanda, their owner over there, um, is fantastic. And then the other side of things, just touching on something else you mentioned as far as the e-collar is concerned, right? Obviously, the e-collar is a very important part of the training process. And you kind of hit the nail on the head as far as, you know, obviously I understand your logic behind it. It's very normal. It's very much what a lot of people say. You know, our goal is not that our dog is scared of things or, or fearing us or anything like that. But a lot of times the fear that you might be seeing in some cases is not so much even a result of like the e-collar or the shock or things like that. A lot of times it has much more to do with the inconsistency of boundaries, period, right? So it's like with him, because maybe your husband does things one way, you do things another way, the way you enforce commands is different sometimes versus other times, et cetera, et cetera. In his mind, it's like, I never know when I'm gonna get corrected for something, right? So because there's no consistency behind it, he can't figure out how to truly avoid the consequence, which is the goal, right? We, we don't wanna have to be hitting that button all yeah. day long. You know what I mean? Uh, we wanna be able to teach a boundary or teach a rule and have him understand that rule. It's no different than like, you shouldn't have to get a speeding ticket three times a week in order to not speed, right? The point of it is you get it and it's like, oh, I think about my behavior for a little bit and I don't do that anymore, yeah, right? So it is gonna be very important, uh, obviously, to stay consistent with that, right? Obviously, yeah. once he goes home, because that's gonna be the make or break with a lot of the success with this stuff. And then obviously, as the baby comes and everything, we'll put in place some really clear protocols as far as, hey, when we have guests come over or when you're doing certain things with the baby or whatever it may be, this is how we handle him. These are the things we make him do and focus on, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> he's gonna have tons of fun while he's here. They get playtime every day, they get walks, they get training. It's, they have a ton of, they get more stimulation here usually than they're getting at home. Okay, that's what I figure. You're getting out, he doesn't want to come home. Don't forget He won't forget you. It's, a, it's, it's an interesting thing, right? The, the um, lot of these dogs that come in, they know this stuff, right? It's, it's, 
nobody says, we're no stranger to this, obviously. We get these dogs in, they've done training elsewhere. This is not another trainer problem. This is not anything, right? This is simply a owner education problem, right? Now, we have some brush up to do with him. We got some scenarios to set up. We gotta get him back in the groove. And a lot of times when people are expecting children, whether the dog has training on them or not, that kind of hard reset of getting them out of the house, getting them back in the swing before they jump back into things can be very beneficial. Um, but these dogs are usually much better than we give them credit for. We just don't know how to effectively communicate with them. So that's what our boy Ernie is gonna learn while he's here. Look at how well I trained this dog in three minutes. Nice job, dog. <laughs> All right, guys, same routines as always. We're now like 12 days in, some shit like that. Still making strides. So last time you guys saw us in the vlogs, the first time he ate out of a bowl near me. Check this out. Eating out of the hand now. We're making some serious strides here. Listen, we're not, it's not perfect yet, right? I keep saying this over and over again. We still got a lot of work to do. He's still scared of me putting the muzzle on, his collars on, but I can't even remember the last time he's tried to bite me over it. He's just a little bit of a weenie over it. And now that he's taking food out of hand, we could start to get some really good progress with this. The feeding out of hand just started like two days ago. He just started taking food out of hand for me. So we are now in a position where we're gonna start to be able to fully leverage that. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna get them all geared up. We're gonna do a training session with him real fast. And then um, we got a bunch of TikTok questions and stuff to answer because we're officially TikTokers now. Our video with this fucking idiot got like almost 7 million views already and everybody's freaking out wants to see updates on Thor everybody's got questions about their dogs so we're gonna try to help them out and answer some of those things good what a good noodle so let's get this muzzle on come here bud sit good job no bite gloves everybody was asking about that the other day when did the bite gloves come off the bike clubs are off. He's still squirming like a motherfucker. It's fine. He's not trying to bite me. It's all that I care about right now. <clears throat> Trauma Central. His new name is Chris. If you guys haven't seen the video... He's Chris Hemsworth, not Thor. There we go. We're making lots of strides. Lots of strides. Good. Rest of his stuff here. Get the little pinch collar on. Hold on, buddy. Yeah, kind of pick his head up for it. Pop this guy on. Gotta pop this guy off. Turn the collar on. Gotta get that guy on. Gotta pop the muzzle off. Okay, and then it's food time. Look at that. Oh, and this is how we build the positive association. His collars come on, then we get snacks, and everything is fun. Look at that. Okay, bed. Good. It's a slow process, right? None of this stuff is quick. That's what I tell everybody. Now, Quick is obviously subjective because in my opinion, right, this is slow from the standpoint of we're not getting like immediate, immediate results with things, but it's very fast from the standpoint of, again, he hasn't even been here for two weeks yet, right? I think tomorrow is officially day like 13 or 14 or something like that. Massive, massive, massive strides with stuff. So we're getting places, right? Again, good. 
We're starting to build engagement, right? We have him working for food. He's taking food out of hand. He's letting me collar him. We're not getting bites anymore. Um, he's socializing really great with other dogs. Okay, he's doing really good, all in all. Bed, good. So this is how we keep it going. Four, come. Good. Four come. Sit. I want to get him in the frame, but I don't think I'll be able to. Come on. What if I just sit use on the your, ground? Use your brain here. Oh. Media brain. How's this? All right, so contrary to popular belief, your dog does not have to be food motivated in order to get them to do something or not to do something. Now, it makes it nicer when they're food motivated. We obviously can keep them more motivated. We can make it a little bit more pleasurable experience for them. And if you're interested in learning how to do that, we actually have a blog post on MiracleCanineTraining.com on how to develop your dog's food drive. That being said, currently, since the dog is not food motivated, you have to focus on a way to just get the dog to do it. So what we utilize is we utilize negative reinforcement, which allows us to communicate to the dog to do something without the need of treats. So we're utilizing pressure to do so, whether that's in the form of leash pressure, e-collar pressure, something of that sort. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to first and foremost teach what the expectation on the walk is, which in our case, what we do is we focus on teaching a come command, which is basically keeping the dog in our bubble. And then we want to make sure we have a clear way to reinforce and back up that position. Um, we would shape that initially with the prong collar. Again, we have videos on how to do that on our YouTube channel. Um, and then from there, we would layer in the e-collar so that we could then hold the dog accountable for doing that specific thing. Once you have the clear expectation taught and the dog understands what it is that we want them to do not in the presence of the distraction, then we start incrementally adding in those distractions and holding the dog accountable for doing that thing by giving them a correction for not doing it, whether that's in the form of a higher level e-collar correction, a leash pop. Some people will utilize something like a pet corrector. Um, there's, again, many ways to do this without the need of treats. Um, and obviously, as you're developing the dog's food drive, you would start to then reinforce for the correct behavior. So once we've stopped the unwanted behavior you could add in treats when the dog is engaging with you instead of the distraction to then get them even further along and create a positive association with doing the correct thing 
All right, so next one is on fighting dogs. So this person has three dogs, two of which get along perfectly fine. The other two are getting into it with each other. So anytime we're looking to figure out fighting dogs, first thing I try to look at is, is the dog inherently aggressive or is this an environmental issue? Sounds like the dogs are not inherently aggressive because they individually get along with other dogs, which means that the environment is causing these issues. Typically speaking, that's gonna be resources, food, toys, affection. So what we need to do is we need to be able to break down every single fight that you've seen happen. You need to clearly outline what exactly happened in it and you need to isolate what was the fight over. Was it a situation where the dogs were competing over food? Was it a situation where the dogs were competing over uh, toys? Or was it a situation where the dogs were competing over affection? The third one is the big one that most people don't realize. They'll be cuddling on the couch with the dog, another dog will come over, the other dog will freak out on that dog or go to attack that dog or snarl at that dog or something like that. And we're like, oh my God, where did it come from? I've never seen that before in my life. When in actuality, you are a resource in that moment. The other dog is trying to steal you, the resource from the other dog, and you're doing nothing about it to intervene and make sure that that doesn't happen, which causes competitions, which creates fights. Once we've isolated what the problem is and where those fights are coming from, what we need to do is we need to figure out a way to advocate and step in and solve those problems for the dog. Meaning if they're fighting over their food bowl, we make sure we're there supervising and when that other dog even thinks about going over to steal food from the other dog, we step in, intervene, correct that dog for it. If one dog even thinks about going and stealing a toy from the other dog, we step in, we intervene, we correct for it. When we're petting one of the dogs and the other dog wants to barge over and push that dog out of the way for some attention, we step in, we intervene, and we correct for it. If you can solve those problems, you will not have fun fighting in your house. We did very good today. Wow, that was very good. Did you see that? Mm -hmm. You probably missed it though. No, I got it. Did you? Mm -hmm. What a good noodle. That's a very good boy. That's a very good boy. Well, let's talk about the vet visit. We have not, we didn't yeah, buy a we're, muzzle, we're we another, haven't practiced. Uh, yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, you, you need to get your own muzzle, right? Like, so like if you're waiting to put it on until you're in a high stress situation where he's already freaked out, Again, I mean, that's another, like, that's just, just not the way to do it, to you know? Succeed. So you put it on before you get there, right? And, yeah, if he hasn't uh, gotten used to wearing one up until this point, yeah, you got you to gotta get one and just start literally putting it on him 10 minutes a day, yeah. you know, just until he starts getting used to it. And, listen, he's been, not going to love it, you know? I mean, right. no dog loves the muzzle by any right. means. But, you know, all I care about is that he's, you know, he just accepts that it's on, right? I don't care if he's happy or, or anything like that. I just care that he's like, all right, it's on, it's not coming off. Oh, okay, David. <laughs> that was it's just, it. It's just not optional, you know? It just goes on, right? And then it's on, right? So you get it on, right? And then you just gotta wear it. That's it, you know? And like I said, if he fights at it or anything like that, don't worry about that. Obviously, if he steps off the bed, still correct him for it and put him back on. But it's normal the first time you put it on, they're gonna be like, oh, get this thing off of me, yeah. you know? <clears throat> you just gotta realize, this is just not coming off, right? But yeah, put him on a bed, right? Enforce your bed stay, and then, you know, if you feel comfortable doing it with the muzzle on, that's fine, obviously, yeah. right? And then it's just, you're doing it, right? Blah, 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 right? right? Do, 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 do. <laughs> And it's just not, it's just not optional, you know? Yeah. That's, that's really the key yeah. with any of this kind of stuff. Just we're, we're not gonna make a big it. deal out of it. We're, we're just doing, doing it. it, you know? And this size seems pretty good. It's a yeah. size five in it. Yeah. So, okay. but yeah, I mean, it's, it's the key. It just helps everybody feel a little bit more secure. That's why I use the muzzle with, like I said, Vinny at the vet is, you know, at this point, like I said, he's fine. Like he, he wasn't before, but at this point he's fine there. Um, and it just, everybody feels safer. They can get in, they could check him, examine him. Yeah. If he does grumble or growl or anything like that, which Vinny will sit there and he'll make noise the whole time. He'll still definitely he let him know he doesn't like it. Right. right? But he doesn't do anything. You know, and they ignore it and check them, you know, examine, do, do whatever thing. they need to do, yeah. and then we leave. And then everybody's fine. So I don't care if the vet doesn't. The vet is not a, a depiction of your dog's behavior, usually. Yeah. It's not a good one, at least.
<laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's easier said than done, obviously, right? But like, yeah, you do. I know. You know, <laughs> you know it, it is one of those things where I tell everybody like, it, it's not even that they could sense it necessarily. It's just like, if you're nervous, it's like, you're just not gonna do the things you need to do, right? You're gonna let things slide because of it, and it's just it's just not gonna get any better, right. you know? And if anything, it's gonna get worse. You're not addressing the problem. Right? Yeah. You're not addressing the problem, and like, you just can't, you can't be scared of your dog, you know? That's not, you know, that's just, that's, that's no good, right? You're not. We had a German Shepherd we worked with recently. His name is Lincoln. So he's a big guy too, and he's 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 much tougher than Odo is. <laughs> um, and Lincoln really did not like having the muzzle put on initially. The owners were scared to do it, stuff like that. We started implementing a uh, protocol where pop him on the bed, real firm about the expectation of that, real high correction if he didn't do it. Then once he got it on, pop that muzzle on. Then once he got it on, here's some treats, right? Oh, Give him some treats you through did it, reward right? For that. We rewarded it, but before we even thought about rewarding it, we made sure we can get that thing on him. Yeah. Right? And then got it on. We weren't bribing him with it. Yeah, yeah. But once it's on, it ain't so bad. Here's some snacks, yeah. whatever, you know? Okay, so obviously this is the center strap that goes between his eyes. This goes under his chin. So what you're going to do is take this thing, again, get it situated, pop it on him, and then it's on. Okay. Got it? Place. How's the dropping food off yeah. the counter going? So, um, you know, we had to practice a few times. Yep. Um, it took like three or four corrections, and for the first day I was home, after we went to the training, he had it I've got it, yeah. He didn't go for it. Um, I, have, I was gone the rest of the week. I just got back last night. Yep. So he's been working with Tom, who he's been yeah. doing most of it. Like treats. That's good. Or it's not so Yeah. Yeah, it's fantastic. He does well with that. I do think there's much more, like, like I said, if I'm cooking and suddenly something drops on the floor. Like, well, that's the picture we wanted to, to train he's for, right? Much more. But he, but the, so have you used those types of things? Yeah. Oh, okay. I did it for the one day I was in town. He, yeah. Okay. He did well. and, and, and we did, and, um, and he calls off the bit. 90% of the time okay. he was working. And yep. Like, but he had to when you say he calls off of it, you mean he just doesn't go for it or you need to correct him? You need to correct him. Okay. Like, not, not correct him with a collar. You need to call him. No. Ooh, don't do that. So, so again, the, the, the thing is he just doesn't grab it, right? So there always needs to be a correction with it. That's how you get to the place. No, right? No, you could no. You use no still, right? But we wouldn't use just a verbal correction, right? If we're gonna tell him no, like if he's going yeah, for it, he's right. gonna get an actual right. correction for that. Which you do, right? Most times. Right? There, there are times that it fell off that. <laughs> That's all right. And like he'll like move like no, and he'll just stay. Well, like, yeah. Like there. Now listen, like in a, a a situation where you're like caught off guard, don't have the training collar on, something like that. If you run into a situation where you have to just tell him no, and he stops, like I'm I'm happy, that's good, obviously. But we want to make sure 99% of the time he's still getting a correction, yeah. which will stop him from even that last little bit of going for it, right? So we have him at a place now where he's calling off a bit nicely, right? If he does go for it, we could get him to stop. We want him to stop going for it though altogether, right? So that's good though. I mean, that's progress from last time. And then before that, we were working on the off leash training with you. Yep. And I almost feel that he's more at, at attention when it's got the loose off and having to stay by you than knowing like the uh -huh. is on and kind of um, I just feel it, like he's more aware. You're correct about that. That he needs to be. The, really the, the difference though, because everybody says that, and I always tell them, right, the difference is, is not that he is seeing that there's no leash on so he needs to be more behaved. The difference is when, the off, when he is off of the leash, there's like, like you can't screw up. 
You know what I mean? So you're more on top of things. You're more diligent about stuff. You're more firm on him, right? So it's more of the psychology to yes. you guys of he doesn't have a leash on, so we gotta keep this dude under Very control. Diligent. You know what I mean? Yes. Where on the leash, there's just that sense sometimes of, ah, it's, you know, it's a little looser, right? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's more of a human thing than it is a dog thing as far as that. But everybody says that. My dog is better behaved off of the leash than on the leash. And I always tell them that. That's why I try to get everybody to shift to that mindset. The leash is just not on, right? Pretend it's not on all the time, you know? Uh, okay, so where are you guys at as far as, so obviously we talked about the muzzle before going to the vet. Where are you guys at outside of that as far as things you don't feel like you have under control, goals, anything like that? Like where are you guys at with stuff right now? good I, I just he's doing well I the food dropping on the floor and even I can play with him and mm -hmm. um, drop it and he, he, he drops it right in front of me mm -hmm. every time now good you know I still am a little I just kick it out of the way because sure. I'm still a little you know sometimes I yeah stand no I understand over it and you're like what's he gonna mm -hmm. do when I go for it but he I don't know I He'll continue to get better with that, but he's yeah, he's a food motivated yeah. dog. You know what I mean? Like I like I can't like 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 if I left a freaking pizza on my coffee table and like went out of the room for ten minutes, like one of the dogs is gonna get. They're all very fit. One of them is gonna go for that thing. You know what I mean? So it's like you have realistic expectations with some of this yeah. stuff too. Of like you know. You know, we're able to verbally control him. We're able to channel those impulses and stuff like that. But like, he's a dog, right? Like he's a working dog and he's a yeah. motivated working yeah. dog, right? At that. So, so a lot of this is just, this is where you get into just, this is the long-term game, right? Of like, you know, as he's getting older, right? And he continues to mature, like we've talked about, right? As you notice that he gets a little more mouthy here, a little bit more interested in this here, whatever it is, you continue to set the tone that it's not something we want. Yeah. You continue to build your confidence that like, there's, uh, this is not a dog to be scared of, right? Like, I, I totally understand, right? I'm totally empathetic to it, obviously, but like, I've seen scary dogs before. Like I could show you some scary dogs, right? This is not a scary dog, but this dog has some attitude. And we knew that from day one that we saw him, right? Day one, you brought him in when he was just a little guy. Yeah. He had some attitude behind yeah. him. And that attitude can look scary sometimes, right? And it absolutely, like we talked about in the last couple of sessions, right? Absolutely can turn into dangerous things, but this is not a dog that wants to do harm on people. You know what I mean? And as long as you go into everything with that mindset of like the attitude he might give you in trying to get the muzzle on or getting him to not take the food or things like that, just, just staying confident through that kind of stuff, you just got to stay like level-headed with that, you know, right? Like examining and all that kind of stuff, right? Like this is a dog where like you just got to get confident. Like, yeah, he's like, what's going on here? Like, why are you messing with me like this, right? And it's like, yeah, like I'm, I'm pushing his buttons right now. You know what I mean? But I'm doing it to show you, right? Like, yeah, he doesn't like it, right? He's giving me that look like, I don't like that you're messing with me and touching my paws and all this kind of stuff. But even if he did, look, like he's turning around to try to nip at my hand and stuff right now. It's, it's just not a big deal, right? I'm just not gonna let him win with this kind of stuff. So whatever it is that you need to do, whether it's again, check his ears or get eye drops in or things like that, right? Or like check his teeth and all that, right? Like even that, right? A little nip at me. No, dude, right? We're not playing that game right now. <clears throat> you know, any of those types of things that you need to do. See, right there, I would have been talking. Yeah. Oh, I understand, right? Fine. And I'm not telling you to like go out of your way to like push yeah. the boundaries and stuff. Reason why I'm showing you this right now is because this is like owning a dog like this is you have to be able to tell them yes. that some of this stuff just doesn't fly, yep. right? And when he starts giving you attitude over things, right? You just yeah. gotta show it, right? You gotta almost dish it right back. You know what I mean? So, so you know, as you're you're getting through these like vet things and nail things and eye drops and all that kind of stuff, that's like your next big thing you need to keep your attention on, which is like we what we got to do with him. Like we just got to do it, you know. And again, using the muzzle is perfectly fine. Yeah. You know, I encourage using the muzzle because the muzzle puts you in a position where if you are a little uncomfortable with it, you could do everything that I just did right there, but feel a little bit more confident. I really think you guys just got to work with him for a little bit with this kind of stuff. You know, I think. I think 
all of your issues you have really good solutions yeah. for, you know what I mean? Yeah. And some of it is just going to be a matter of you staying persistent with yeah. stuff and just continuing to use your training where you need to use yeah. your training, right? And just don't change anything about what you're doing. Just continue adding in these little details like the muzzle, like we talked for the vet visits or, or you're examining. I would push the buttons with that a little bit more and stuff, right? Um, and just, just keep plugging away and, you know, if in four or five weeks you run into any sort of new problems or anything like obviously you guys know how to get a hold of me like okay. we'll get you back in and, okay. and get you in for another, another follow-up with it and stuff but like i think he's looking really good okay.